Well, good morning, everybody. I want to say hello to those of you, of course, here with me in Knox Hall, and whether you're uh, watching via live video feed from the sanctuary or watching online or listening by radio, really glad that you're here today. In the 1800s, there lived a uh, Swedish chemist and inventor turned businessman named Alfred, and he held 355 patents, but the most famous was for dynamite. He was an inventor of all kinds of explosives, and he thought that his inventions would be used for construction, like in the making of roads, and they were, but very early on, the military reasoned that Alfred's inventions would make very good weapons, and very soon, the primary customers became world armies, and it made Alfred very rich. He himself was a pacifist, but his inventions changed warfare. In 1888, his brother Ludwig uh, passed away in France from a heart attack, and thanks to poor communication and bad reporting, at least one French newspaper uh, reported that it was Alfred who died, not his brother, the more famous uh, brother. And imagine what it would be to open up a newspaper and read your own obituary. Uh, it would be a cause for reflection for anybody, but especially for Alfred because the obituary was very scathing. He saw his name in the newspaper with lines like this, the merchant of death is dead. The man who became rich by finding ways to kill more people faster than ever before died yesterday. Now the newspaper printed a correction, but this incident caused Alfred to rethink his life and his uh, career. He did not want to be remembered for death and destruction, so he decided to change his legacy and immediately rewrote his last will and testament, giving the, the vast majority of, of his estate hundreds of millions of dollars toward the giving of an annual prize uh, for those who, quote, during the preceding year shall have conferred the greatest benefit on mankind. And you have figured out by now that I'm talking about Alfred Nobel and the famous Nobel Peace Prize. According to the stipulations of his will, the Nobel Peace Prize was to be awarded, quote, to the person who shall have done the most or best work for fraternity between nations and the abolition or reduction of standing armies and the formation and spreading of peace. Alfred Nobel decided he wanted his lasting legacy to be peace. Tomorrow is Veterans Day in the United States, and we honor and celebrate veterans for their contribution to peace. Veterans want their lasting legacy to be not, not war, but peace. That's what lies behind all the sacrifice. Alfred Nobel wanted his legacy to be not war, but peace. So I've titled today's sermon, A Nobler Peace Prize. See what I did there? Yeah. Uh, we're in a series on the Beatitudes of Jesus. At the opening of the Sermon on the Mount, uh, Jesus gives these eight Beatitudes, eight statements about the blessed life, about life inside the kingdom of God. And today we get to statement number eight, blessed are the peacemakers for they will be called children of God. This is probably the most relevant beatitude for our times. We live in a world that is not at peace. We ourselves are not at peace. We are divided, conflicted, alienated, and estranged. And yet peacemaking is the heart of God. Reconciliation is what God does. Now, the word that Matthew used for peace is the Greek word arene, but his listeners, his people he was writing to, was largely a Jewish audience. So no doubt when they heard the word peace, they thought of the Hebrew word shalom. Uh, shalom, we translate peace, but it's much larger than that. Shalom, peace, is not just the absence of conflict. It is the fullness of God's blessing in your life. Theologian Neil Planktica has a book about sin, and the title of the book is Not the Way It's Supposed to Be. Not the Way It's Supposed to Be. And this is his definition of shalom in this book. He says, in the Bible, shalom means universal flourishing, wholeness, and delight. 
a rich state of affairs in which the natural needs are satisfied and natural gifts are fruitfully employed all underneath the ark of God's love. Shalom, in other words, is the way things ought to be. Shalom is the way things ought to be. It's the way God willed the world to be when he created it. No sickness, no hungry babies, no bullies, no death, no homelessness, no war, no oppression, no injustice. Paradise. Shalom. And we are to work to restore shalom wherever it is broken in our world. The world needs more peacemakers. Now notice what, what Jesus did not say here, because he could have said lots of other things. Jesus did not say, blessed are the peaceful, although that would make perfect sense. We're talking about the blessed life. He could have said, blessed are the peaceful, for they will get a good night's rest. But he did not say that. Uh, he could have said, blessed are the peaceable, that would also seem like a good choice for the blessed life. He could have said, blessed are the peaceable, for they will never engage in conflict. But he did, he did, he did not say that. Uh, he could have said other things. He could have said, blessed are the peace-loving. You know, blessed are the peace-loving, for they will become hippies. <laughs> but he did not say any of those things. He said, blessed are the peacemakers. Blessed are the makers of peace. Uh, that implies some initiation and involvement. You can't sit on the sidelines and make peace. It implies action. Now, I may have said earlier in this series that these are the be attitudes, not the do attitudes. In other words, the beatitudes are a lot more about being and character than they are about rules and doing. In fact, this is really the first beatitude that asks us to do anything. And of course, being and doing are connected, of course. Who we are flows into our actions. Our actions come from our character. The Apostle Paul put it this way in Colossians. And let the peace that comes from Christ rule in your hearts. For as members of one body, you are called to live in peace. And always be thankful. We let the peace that comes from Christ rule in our hearts. And then we can become peacemakers. Then we can pursue peace. Look at what Peter writes here. He says, For whoever would love life and see good days must keep their tongue from evil and their lips from deceitful speech. They must turn from evil and do good. They must seek peace and pursue it. They must seek peace and pursue it, seek and pursue uh, very strong action verbs. We don't sit on the sidelines, we are to make this kind of peace. Paul said, let us therefore make every effort to do what leads to peace and to mutual edification. We're to make every effort. We try and then we try again. And when it comes to relational peace between another person, we listen, we seek to understand, we give the benefit of the doubt, we clarify, we encourage, we forgive. I one time attended a, a seminar on biblical reconciliation, went through the, the, the wisdom of the Bible on how to do this, and the seminar presenter at one point, she said this line, she said, uh, the most spiritual among the two is the one who initiates peace first. The most spiritual one goes first when it comes to peace. And I have to think about whether that's really what the Bible says or whether she was just playing to a room full of egos because suddenly we're like, oh, no, no, you don't, you don't forgive me first. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to forgive you first. And I'm, I'm going to go first just to show how spiritual I am, uh, thus proving how non-spiritual we all were. But generally I think it's true. The, the, the most spiritual of the two, the one who lives most fully in this kingdom that Jesus describes, they are the ones who initiate the peacemaking process. Where is peace needed today? First of all, we need peace with God. Jonathan Edwards uh, has been identified as the first American intellectual. He's buried uh, in, on the campus of Princeton. I've, I've been to his burial site. He was the president of Princeton for a short time before his death. And he wrote a very famous essay titled Men, and I think today you would say men and women, people, humans, men, 
Natural Enemies with God. Sounds like a clever title for a fun sermon, right? Enemies with God. And he, and he says that, that we are uh, natural, naturally at enmity with God intellectually, emotionally, and volitionally. That we're at odds with God intellectually because we don't believe God. When God says things like through his prophet Isaiah that God's ways are not our ways and his thoughts are not our thoughts and that God loves us more than we know and we don't, we don't buy that. And Jonathan Edwards goes on, talks about dozens of ways that we are actually enemies with God. Thankfully, according to Ephesians 1.3 and lots of other places, God has blessed us with every spiritual blessing. God has taken care of everything so that peace with God is possible. God is the more spiritual of the two of you. And so God has initiated. God has made all the arrangements. God has done so at great personal cost to himself. He has demonstrated his love, and we need only to accept his peace offer. Most people, I think, have a sense of not being right with God. Sometimes it can feel like a, a restlessness. Uh, sometimes it takes the form of a, of a sense of guilt that we can't shake. Uh, sometimes it feels oddly like an unexplainable sense of homesickness. But the good news of the Bible is that God is ready to receive you home as a child in a restored relationship. This peace is available to you, so have your peace talk with God. And then once we have peace from God, then we can be at peace with other people, and the next category are people even within the same church. Paul says in Galatians, all of you are children of God through faith. There is no longer Jew nor Gentile, slave nor free, male or female. You are all one in Christ Jesus. Paul is saying your politics should no longer divide you. Your ethnicity, your gender should no longer divide you. Class, income, power dynamics are now irrelevant. You are all part of one family, and we are to pursue peace even with our opponents. And then we can go on to your peace with your family. Are you letting a problem become bigger than a relationship? Uh, has the lack of peace in your family affected the way that your family spends the Thanksgiving holiday? Are you nursing a grudge? Paul wrote, if it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Peace is not always possible, but as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. This would be a good question for self-reflection. Uh, have I done everything that I can do to be at peace with this person? I can't control what other people do, but as far as it depends on me, am I at peace? Then there's peace with our community and with our nation and with our planet. Where and how can I bring shalom, wholeness and delight to the places where it is broken or absent? How can I bring things back to the way that they're supposed to be? In the case of relational peace between people, between two people, here are some things that peacemakers don't do. Just notice that peacemakers don't do. They don't have to be right. right? Make sure you don't love being right more than you love that person. You can win the argument and lose the relationship. Peacemakers don't have to have the last word. The need for having the last word is usually driven by ego, not peace. Peacemakers don't stoke the hatred that's already prevalent. It's very easy in a peaceless situation to just stoke each other up, to crank each other up, to deepen the divides. Peacemakers don't do that. Peacemakers don't hear just one side of the story. We tend to uh, want to hear only what we already believe. And so we watch news stations that will support our views and only those stations. And we surround ourselves with people who will just tell us uh, what we want to hear. And peacemakers don't take sides. They, they don't find themselves in the middle of relational conflict. Here's what peacemakers, peacemakers do do, and these are all in your, uh, your notes in your app. Peacemakers listen with a broad bandwidth, listening to people they agree with and disagree with. 
Peacemakers listen longer than others ever would consider doing. Peacemakers lead with their intellect, not their emotions, so it doesn't get heated in the middle of it. Peacemakers seek to understand before being understood, and they value the person more than the problem. You may have a relational rift that you have determined is irreparable. And there are places in our world today where ethnic divisions are so uh, deep that it seems impossible to bridge. You know, those places in the world where hatred has lasted for generations and it seems uh, too far gone for peace. In the first century, the deepest cultural and religious divide was between Jews and Gentiles. And it was stark. You, you talk about enmity and hostility and violence and hatred in that time and place. It was between the Jews and the Gentiles. And then some Jews and Gentiles begin to follow Jesus. And all that enmity, all that violence, all that hatred finds its way into the church. And the church is divided and it seems like impossible and it's, it's ethnic and it's generational and it's deep. It's a mess. And then eventually the love and the unity that emerged, that developed, became one of the greatest testimonies to the power of Christ. And the Apostle Paul writes about this in Ephesians. He says, For Jesus himself is our peace, who has made the two groups one and has destroyed the barrier, great language, the dividing wall of hostility, by setting aside in his flesh the law with its commands and regulations. His purpose was to create in himself one new humanity out of the two, thus making peace, and in one body to reconcile both of them to God through the cross by which he put to death their hostility. He came and preached peace to you who, are, who were far away and peace to those who were near, for through him we both have access to the Father by one spirit. Jesus himself is our peace, and he makes peace possible in unimaginable situations. It is possible. Peace is, it's kind of his thing, right? Here's some passages you're going to hear a lot in this next season. 700 years before Jesus, the prophet Isaiah wrote, For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. On the night that Jesus was born, Luke records, Suddenly a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in highest heaven and on earth, Peace to those on whom his favor rests. Jesus is the great bringer of peace. He's the original peacemaker. And I want to plead with you to become a peacemaker. Are you right with God? There are a lot of people here today who can tell you that being an enemy of God does not work. Make peace with your God. Are you right with your family? And more than a few people told me that several years ago during the last presidential election, words were exchanged in their family that created wounds that still have not yet been healed. Do not make that mistake again. Prize people over politics. Forgive those who've hurt you. And are you right with your world? We get to join God in his work of setting this world right. We get to join God in his work of creating the world that is supposed to be. We get to introduce people to the Prince of Peace. In 1994, the recipient of the Nobel Peace Prize was Yitzhak Rabin, who was then the Prime Minister of Israel. He was given the award for his phenomenal work toward peace in the Middle East. Uh, difficult to this day. Rabin is known still now as a great peacemaker. He signed historic peace agreements with Palestinian leaders as part of the Oslo Accords. He signed a, a, a peace agreement with neighboring Jordan. Uh, the Nobel Peace Prize was given not just to Rabin alone, but also to his rival, uh, Palestinian leader Yasser Arafat. And in 1993, the impossible happened. Yitzhak Rabin and Yasser Arafat shook hands. Now, don't miss the power of this moment. This was extraordinary. 
unthinkable, deemed impossible. And Yitzhak Rabin was criticized and applauded by his people. Uh, how could you shake hands with that man? And Yitzhak Rabin said, peace is made not with friends, peace is made with enemies. And it looked like peace was, had taken a huge step forward in the Middle East. And in 1995, Yitzhak Rabin was assassinated by an Israeli extremist. The assassin saw himself as a hero, as a nationalist, as someone preserving the historic enmity between people groups. See, see, not everyone wants peace. Not everyone wants peace. Hate can be energizing. Rigidness can be comforting and even identity forming. Not everybody welcomes peacemakers, right? Pe peacemakers challenge our assumptions. They push us beyond our comfort zone. Peacemakers just won't leave things the way that they are. Jesus came as the Prince of Peace, and what did we do to him? We could talk about Yitzhak Rabin or Martin Luther King Jr. or Jesus of Nazareth. I, I don't know why violent people want to kill people of peace. But I do know that you and I get to decide whether we for ourselves are going to be people of violence or people of peace. And as you sort that out, please remember that Jesus said, blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Let's pray. God, we thank you for sending Jesus. He is the one who in the midst of the storm says, peace, be still. Jesus is saying that to some of us right now. Thank you, Jesus. You are the one who not only speaks peace over us, but who died to make peace with God and peace with each other possible. We did not receive you well the first time we will not make that mistake again. Give us the courage to humble ourselves and receive the peace that only you can provide. Oh God, give us eyes to see. For those who are here today who are lacking peace with you, God, with a family member, with a friend, move us to action. Help us to take difficult steps. We long to be called children of God. We pray the words attributed long ago to a saint named Francis. Lord, make me an instrument of your peace. Where there is hatred, let me show love. Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is doubt, faith. Where there is despair, hope. Where there is darkness, light. Where there is sadness, joy. We pray these prayers in the name of the one who is our peace, Jesus our Lord. And everybody said.